Alrighty, we are live and I am so excited to chat with you today, Tommy. So for those of you who don't know, Tommy is a professional climber who's made first ascents of some of the hardest climbing routes in the, in the U.S. And he's a fellow Patagonia ambassador and climate activist. So today I thought it would be really fun to sit down and chat about parenthood, activism, and climbing. So Tommy, welcome to the show. Yeah, great to be here. Yeah, and Carolyn, you've been you've been hard driving lately. It's been cool to see all that you've been doing. You yeah, too. You too. I um, it was really cool. Yeah, it's been really cool just to uh, read some of your captions on Instagram, and then also when we went to the Senate in September to testify together. That was an incredible opportunity, and yeah, I was really grateful for that. So, where are you chatting with me from today? So I'm. I live in Estes Park, Colorado. I think you said that. Um, I'm in my van right now because my kids are running amok. We're trying to do the homeschool thing, which makes it crazy <laughs> in the house. So I'm out, I'm just in my driveway in my van. <laughs> yep. How's your family doing right now? Uh, I mean, we've got it pretty good, really, like considering everything. Like if we no ignore the rest of the world, um, our scene at home is, is really nice. Um, you know, we live in a mountain town. Um, we can socially distance easily. I can get out in the national forest and go running and stuff pretty easily. So, um, yeah, like kind of selfishly, it's, it's, it's life is, is decent. The whole, like the homeschooling thing, we've gotten used to our kids going off to school so we could, you know, crank on work and kind of do our thing. Um, and that changed. So we have them home all the time, which is both good and bad, mostly good though, actually lots and lots of super quality family time. How old are your kids? Fitz just turned seven, right? Yeah, Fitz just turned seven. Ingrid turned uh, four, like a month before that. Ingrid's the little girl. Um, yeah, yeah, they're like peaking in, you know, cuteness and kind of craziness at the same time. They're so cute. I love seeing the photos of your children on your social media and just following that part of your adventure. Did you always know you wanted to be a dad and that you wanted children? No. Definitely. No. <laughs> no, I think, I think, I think probably that stuff for me and for a lot of people was inspired by uh, the partner that you have. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't know. I was like a selfish climber. I thought nothing about nothing, but like, you know, sending hard climbs for so long. And, uh, but some, at some point you got to grow up. So, <laughs> so what, like, when did you know it was time to kind of go on that part of the adventure? I still don't know. <laughs> you still don't know. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's good advice. Cause I'm always like, yeah, I'm kind of like 50, 50. Like I've always sort of seen myself as a mother, but then I'm like, we love to go on our expeditions. And, and um, yeah, I think that's really interesting because some people are like, you have to know like a hundred percent that you want them. And then, you know, people just give you different advice. So how do you juggle now your professional goals and family life with your two small kids? I mean, we multitask a lot. Like we bring our family with us on the adventures um, a lot of the time, which has changed the nature of the adventure somewhat. I definitely um, think about risk management a lot different than I used to. Um, and the, the, the trips usually, um, like if I do a big international trip, usually I have the time where, where I'm with the family and then I have like a two week period where I'm just purely focused on whether whatever climbing objective um, I have during that time. And, and I do probably two big international trips a year. Got um, it. And then the rest of the time I kind of do my normal travel, but I, I really try and make a non-strict policy of never being away from them for more than two weeks. And the only time that I've um, not done that was actually on the Donwall when I was on the face of El Cap for 19 days. That's the only time when it's been more than two weeks, so. Yeah, that's actually was going to be one of my questions. Um, how old were your children when you were on the Dawn Wall? And was it hard for you to be away from them for all those days? I mean, I was, let's see, Fit, Ingrid wasn't born yet. Fitz was just one year old or oh. yeah, one and a half years old at that time. And I mean, in some ways it was hard, but that climb was like, it was a moment, you know, I knew that this was something that I'd never forget. And they were yeah. down there in the meadow. I could actually see them like running around in the meadow. Um, did that so, make it harder or easier? Made it easier because okay. they were they were kind of wrapped up in the excitement of it too. You know, they knew that yeah. you know, knew that daddy had been working so hard on this for so long. So he was pretty excited. That's so cool. I mean, that's probably like deeply embedded in their DNA now, you know? <laughs> yeah, who knows? Who knows? Yeah, I don't I don't really know how it uh 
how it affects them. I know Fitz yeah. does say he wants to climb El Cap, but he doesn't actually like the act of climbing that much. <laughs> well, so. he's still so young. I mean, I feel like when I was that age, like I would go back and forth about whether I liked skiing because some days it's just miserable when you're a small child. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's really interesting. So when you're on your, I'm really curious about this, this, your international trips. So they come with you for part of the trip. Like, do they go to base camp or how do you, how, do you have a nanny or what does that look like? Yeah, we don't have a nanny. Um, generally, since my kids have been born, I've picked trips that are not full expedition style. Like I've kind of stopped doing those trips for now. Got so we, we go to Europe a lot. And so we, you know, rent Airbnbs um, in different places and travel around in Europe. Um, I've gone to Patagonia with them a couple times. And there's the same. It's, it's funny because it's like an alpine climbing area, but the town of El Chal 10 is pretty modern and legit and actually a lovely place to bring kids like the culture loves children there so when you go on Aer Lina's, you know on the on the Argentine airline they like treat you super well you get to town and um I remember the first year I went Fitz was really young he was like eight months and and I was like worried about it but there was somebody who only gave us a house because I had a chill like we got the sweetest house in El Chal 10 because they're like oh you have your family with you we want you to have a good time and we'd go into restaurants and they would take they'd take fits for like an hour like the, the restaurant owners would take him into the kitchen for like an hour and play with them so that we could have our meal it's just so different there than it was here and I and I was like weirdly I was like man traveling to Argentina with a child is easier than not having a child <laughs> that's that's crazy Strangely. and then they're so used to, and they're so yeah and they're so used to traveling now that um it's kind of the same like when we travel they're super engaged they're blossoming when we're home they're a little bit more of a pain in the butt <laughs> that's really cool what other countries have been fun to travel to with the kids uh i mean we've been all over europe yeah uh we, we've been to yeah and, and europe is you know just really really well set up for yeah. kids um i'm trying to think where else have we brought them i, do, I guess just europe and south america those yeah. are the only places so far yeah that's cool yeah i mean i was thinking like if we went on himalayan expeditions if we had kids like maybe we could bring them to base camp but it's just so hard to wrap my head around like first of all just getting myself ready and then getting all the baby stuff ready too like that's a whole nother crux so how do you manage all the luggage or do you have your yeah set up pretty light and fast and minimal no it's not that light and fast <laughs> no. basically all trips feel a little bit like expedition travel now like you have a lot of luggage you have a lot of logistics it's like slightly stressful you're trying to figure out a lot of stuff but exciting at the same time and so i feel like my expeditions actually really prepared me for traveling as a parent yeah yeah so what was it like do you what was it like living in the van with the kids that could be tight. We upgraded our van when we had a second child. We got the we got a giant one now. Um, still just a van though. We didn't go full RV, which sometimes I feel like we should have just gone full RV. Yeah. Um, but I, I don't know. Usually, van life for me isn't about the van. It's about the places that we're going. Yeah. So as long as we we try and go places where the weather's pretty nice, so that we can spend most of our time outside. Um, we sleep in the van, and you know you're just you're just constantly in beautiful places and outside. So it's like one of my favorite things to do, even though the scene in the van is somewhat disastrous. Like, you know, you see all those van life photos where like the bed's perfectly made and you've got like your steaming cup of coffee on the counter and it just is like clean. That's not our scene at yeah. all. Yeah, it's it's hectic. And I'm <laughs> sure. Well, I think that people really like to see the reality too. Like, I feel like some of my better performing social media posts do show like the total chaos and not yeah. just the perfectly curated like packing shots. So I think yeah. that people appreciate that for sure. Is it hard to stay in climbing shape and to avoid the dad bod? <laughs> mm, yeah, a little bit. I mean, the, the time to climb is, is harder to find. Um, yeah. I'm kind of just like an exercise addict in a lot of ways. So I I find ways to get out and run or mm -hmm. mountain bike. I feel like I'm generally fit, but like the specific, like climbing is hugely time intensive to be a good climber. So time you gotta intensive. You got to go out for like, yeah, like five, six, seven hours a day, like five days a week or something. 
and I don't have that anymore. Yeah. Um, so I think I, I pick, I've, I've sort of like relied in recent years on the, on the types of climbing that my experience kind of makes up for the fact that I'm not maybe like quite as fit. Right. So like lifting up the kids that doesn't like help with the forearm strength. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I got, I got, I, when I first, when Fitz was born, I was like, I'm going to lose it. I got to keep training. So I was hangboarding all the time, but I was also carrying him around and I got wicked tendonitis in my elbows. So I've heard that's really common for a lot of new parents. Yeah. Common injury. So how long did that take? How did you resolve that injury? Oh, I just went to my physical therapist and she gave me like a couple stretches and uh, some exercises and that sorted it out pretty quickly, actually. Nice. So somebody told me that they saw you speak at a, they, that you did a slideshow many years ago and the audience was asking about your training and you told people that you didn't really train, you just went and climbed. So I'm curious now, do you have like a more specific training regimen or do you still just kind of like freestyle it? Yeah, I wonder, I wonder what that, how long ago that was. I mean, if that was like more than 10 years ago, I, I yes, I did. Yeah. Yeah. I just went and climbed, but I climbed like, you know, 40 hours a week or something. So, right. um, I didn't, I didn't chart things. I didn't, um, I didn't bring any science to it back then. I just, I just figured that if I was climbing and trying as hard as I could, as much as possible, that was good enough. That was kind of the mentality of the day for climbers. Um, now with the upcoming Olympics and stuff, everybody's getting way more scientific. I had some big climbing goals that I needed to like get better. And mm -hmm. so about five years ago, I started bringing in the science. Like I said, I, I had the hangboard when Fitz was first born. Um, and nowadays it is a bit more regimented. I've, I've even contemplated getting like a coach recently yeah um so that they can really lay it out for me and help me become as efficient as I can but I haven't I haven't done that yet I'm still I'm like a uh reluctant um organized person I'm just <laughs> I just kind of I kind of fly by the seat of my pants so much of my life so um I am starting to button up my scene but I'm only halfway there who, so who would be your coach if you were to hire a coach? Because it seems like you have such a specific like mindset and your goals are so specific and your skills. So like who could coach you? Yeah. So there's a, there's an organization called Lattice training out of the UK, but they, they have some people in the U S that do it where they, they bring you into a, a facility and they test all of your various strengths and weaknesses and and talk through the goals that you want and then they they cater make a train plan for you um taking kind of everything into account and so i would probably probably use them that's cool yeah, yeah. what was that called lattice training lattice. cool yeah. yeah i did um a stint i worked with steve house's coach scott johnston a few years ago the guy yeah. who co-wrote training for the new alpinism and it was so different to have like an actual training program and it's um i actually was like wait i want to be in the mountains more like i it's not enough time out there like in the alpine like, yeah. let me, but it, it was really interesting. And I did really gain a lot of strength and especially like doing the things that I didn't really want to do, like the gym sessions. <laughs> yeah. It was it was, helpful? So it was helpful in the end, you thought? Oh yeah. It was really helpful. Like I would do these because I was training to go to Peru to climb and ski in the Cordillera Blanca. And so like my workouts, I'd have to go do like 7,000 vertical feet with like a 30 or 40 pound pack in mountain boots. Oh, and it beautiful. was, it took a long time. Like, luckily it was right around the time I met Rob and he was super keen to do those workouts with me. So he would load up his pack and then, but it was like, even just hard to plan out to find the right routes where I could get that much vert in a day with yeah. weather and everything else. Oh. Like you have to do multiple laps up the mountains here. Yeah. So, but I feel like those strength gains, like putting down that base, that foundation has been really helpful. And like now, since I went through that, I feel like I, it's kind of just in my back pocket now. <laughs> like so I you, can, don't have to, you don't have to continue to do 7,000 vertical feet with a bag full of rocks and mountain boots to stay strong. I feel like I don't, I, I, I hope I don't have to keep doing it. I feel like I did that in 2015. So five years later, I feel like I still have that. I can like draw upon when I need it. Yeah.
Well, that's good to hear. Yeah. Uh, with the, with climbing specific stuff, like the finger strength specifically, like if I don't train it constantly, yeah. So that's kind of the that's kind of the downside. You could train for months and then get sick for three weeks and it's mostly gone. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's like climbing strength for like hard climbing is so specific to like this part of your arm. You know, like it's it's crazy. Yeah. yeah. Though I feel a little bit better about myself hearing that you also kind of fly by the seat of your pants because as all these athletes now are like always training and always showing these crazy workouts online, I'm always like, geez, I feel like I'm, I, I'm the same way. Like I'm just always figuring it out as I go along. So I feel a little bit better that you're the same way. <laughs> yeah. I feel like I'm a hybrid because there was a period of my life where like, you know, Chris Sharma was like the main influence and that guy never trains at all. He just goes out and you know, tries hard. And so that's mostly what I've done. Yeah. Well, there's something to be said for that, but like, keep like to keep your edge in the mountains, you know? Yeah. But you gotta, you gotta, you gotta do what keeps the excitement high. I, I feel like that. Like if training is something that you don't enjoy and it's going to make you depressed, then yeah. probably shouldn't focus on it. But if, but some people really love training. Yeah. Yeah. It can be really fun. I think what I really learned from my time training with Scott was that like, if you're training to be a ski mountaineer or like a ski alpinist, you can't spend 90% of your time doing that because it's, you'll, you'll get hurt or you'll die because it's dangerous. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so I think that that was like one of the biggest take-homes is to find more of a sense of balance with my training and not always need to be out there, like getting that huge adrenaline rush. Yeah. Right. So that I can have like a long, long career. Yep. Do yep. this till I'm 100. That's my, that's my dream really. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. So I wanted to ask you a little bit about your skincare routine because you, your skin is so nice. So how do you keep it? How, like, do you have any moisturizers you use or like, do you use sunscreen? Like how do you keep your, your skin so nice? That's so funny. Nobody's ever said my skin is so nice. That's a very lovely statement. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I mean, I've, I I actually am sponsored by a skincare company, Climb On. Oh, cool. Yeah, that's mostly I've mostly used it. I mean, you can kind of use it anywhere, but that's I. You know, I've, it's funny. Like when I go up on big walls, I really think a lot about the skin on my fingertips. Like I don't really think about the skin on my face. I feel like I'm destined to be a you know wrinkly old ha- haggard man at some point in my life but the fingertips it's like that affects performance and so I actually do bring like a pretty big kit up on the wall with me with all these different like lotions and you know files and razor blades and spend a lot of time like staring at my fingertips trying to figure out how to make them you know yeah yeah I mean success on those kinds of things is really about nailing the basics and taking care of those little things before they become big things for sure yeah do you have any hair products that you use? <laughs> I use whatever's sitting on the edge of the tub. <laughs> and then any other tips for like staying fresh and clean on an expedition or on a big wall? Oh, certainly not my strength. <laughs> I am blessed. I am blessed with very, I don't sweat much. So oh, that's actually, nice. And, and one time, you know, I've got these, I've got like that, that climber toe fungus thing going on. And uh, one time I was on an expedition and I was taking this super gnarly medication called Lamisil that's bad for you, actually. It's like bad for your liver, but it clears up your toenails. That, I had no BO that for a month without, I, I spent a whole, I spent a five week trip and didn't even shower once. And I, wow. I smelled fresh the whole way. So maybe there's. That's, that's <laughs> incredible. Five weeks. That's gotta be like, that's a, that's a long stretch without a shower. Yeah. 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 There's a there's phar- pharmaceutical um, solutions to uh, not bathing. <laughs> wow, I'll have to look into that for my next expedition. <laughs> yeah, I don't, if you're willing to sacrifice your liver, which is probably yeah, not worth it. probably yeah. not worth it. Yeah, yeah. Um, what kind? Ca- I wanted to talk a little bit about Patagonia gear because I know that we're both Patagonia athletes. So, what's your favorite piece of Patagonia clothing or gear right now? <sighs> You know, I've, since I haven't been climbing much, um, I've been, I've gotten into running quite mm-hmm. about quite a bit lately. And so I've been poaching the trail running line. Um, and, uh, the air shed hoodie is the bomb. I love that thing for running. It seems so, 
light and kind of like I mean, in, like the season in Estes Park where I live is you know it's kind of becoming spring summerish. It's pretty warm, but we still get cold weather. So yeah, it's it's good for that. Um, and I'm still a fan of some of the old school stuff. Like I still, you know, I still wear the R1 a ton mm -hmm. and the Cat 4 hoodie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. There's there's so many. Yeah. Can't yeah. What about you? What are you What are you into? Well, I've actually been really stoked on the new trail running shorts. Um, I forget what they're called, but they're like these tighter sort of like bike shorts with pockets on the sides. And they're part of that high endurance running kit that Claire and Luke worked on. Yeah, so is the Airshed. That's part of that kit as well. Yeah, yeah so I've been, they, they killed it with that. I've been really stoked on that. And then, I mean, yeah, like the R1 and then that new zigzag I think it's the new cap for, or is it the new R1 for next year that I've been testing? That piece is pretty sweet too. Mm -hmm. I don't yeah. think I have it on. But we have some really cool, um, like new light and fast ski mountaineering gear coming out next year that I'm really, that I'm really, really stoked on. Like this, it's called the Upstride Kit and it was sort of designed for like the Euro ski tour, but it's just like really great for fast and light kind of ski mo inspired backcountry skiing. Oh, cool. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. exciting. I, I'm getting more and more and that kind of, that was going to be my spring this year. Actually, I wasn't going to Europe so I could do a bunch of ski mountaineering here in Rocky mountain. And, um, I started before, before we went on lockdown, got some good days in, but there, I'm sure next year I'll be excited to do it. How's the snowpack there? I mean, is it possible that you'll still have snow into June to ski some of that stuff? Yeah. Yeah. There was yeah. quite a bit of snow this year. You have to hike quite a ways to get to the, to the, you know, hike off snow quite a ways before you got yeah. to the snow. So it would be the mission, the kind of missions where you're out for eight hours and you're making turns for like 15 minutes. Right. Uh, yeah. We turns. Everything gets all muddy. Cause you have to like put all your trail running stuff back into your pack and <laughs> yeah. yeah a bit of that. The, the ground here is so like rocky. It's Rocky Mountain National Park that there's almost no mud. Stranger. Oh, that's nice. That's nice. <laughs> Well, that's cool. So, I mean, how, like how, how much of, I, it's interesting to me because like, I feel the same way, like with skiing that I like to climb and trail run too. And so like, um, how do you kind of like balance all these different sports that you do or like, where does the inspiration for skiing come from? I mean, I've been skiing. I was on a ski team when I was like 10 years old. Oh, so cool. I skied a bunch. Um, there was a ski resort here in my town when I was young. That yeah. I would, like to my babysitter my parents would drop me off in the morning and pick me up in the evening evening there every day um so I've kind of always been into it but I got so obsessed by climbing for a lot of years that I I just didn't ski and now with a family um like and then I despised resort skiing forever but then when Fitz started we wanted to teach him how to ski and just be well-rounded we started going resort skiing again a little bit and um and then i realized that skiing is is just a really fun family activity and mm -hmm. i think that kind of piqued my interest yeah. and then i don't know i just had a friend who was really into it here in estes so I, I usually i do pretty short missions like i don't do big ski expeditions that you know i do like two or three days a year where i'm out all day but for the most part i get up at like you know four o'clock in the morning and i'm back by like 11. Mm -hmm. so you can do that skiing yeah. Yeah. It's, it is such a wonderful lifelong sport and it's awesome that you're introducing your kids to it at such a young age, because it's really fun with my dad now and my nieces and nephews to have like three generations of family out on the slopes. Right. Does your, does your whole family live in, uh, in Utah as well? Are you with near them? Yeah. I moved here with my parents when I was 15 and my little brother lives here. And then I have a lot of extended family here. And then my older brothers live in the Midwest where I grew up. I grew up in right. Minnesota. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So everyone kind of comes here for holidays and, and I was teaching my two-year-old nieces how to ski this year for the first time, which was really fun, but also like a crazy workout for my back and hamstrings, like picking up the kids. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> it was a lot of fun. So what's yeah. next with climbing and with your mountain goals? Do you have any big projects lined up? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I had a big El Cap climb, you know, El Capitan, I'm still addicted to Yosemite and I had a big project I thought was going to be multi-year, but we did it last year, like 
just ended up being easier than I thought. So in terms of like the type of climbing goal that I've spent the last 25 years of my life pursuing, I'm like a little bit directionless Mm -hmm. at the moment. But with the whole COVID situation, I've been um, able to go running a lot. And so I'm starting to think about these big link ups. And those are kind of nice too, because, um, you know, they're not, I don't feel like I'm likely to die on them, um, they're, but they're, they feel like real deal adventure. And so um, I've actually been conceiving with my buddy, Adam Stack, this, this link up in Rocky Mountain National Park um, that links all the major climbing formations. And it, it's probably a little bit similar to that, like Grand Traverse in Utah, like the one that goes around Little yeah, Conwood. The world. But, yeah. Is that what that's called? The yeah. Wasatch Ultimate Ridge link up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So like that, but, um, but with big walls in it, like, you know, like thousand and 2000 foot walls that you gotta, you know, bring a rope and, and climb, but like I don't know, 30 or 40 miles and like, you know, 20,000 plus elevation gain, like trying to do something. So, um, the climbing isn't super hard on, it's like five eleven and under mostly, but the, uh, just like the moving that much on my legs is what I need to train for. So I've been, I've been kind of getting into that. Cool. That sounds like an awesome earlier and the running that I'm doing now. So yeah, yeah. that sounds like a really cool project. I love those backyard projects too. Yeah. And I also like it that I, I literally don't have to drive to do it. It's like right at home and I've been becoming progressively more self-conscious about the amount of airplane travel mm-hmm. that I've done. So um, being, you know, trying to keep it close to home more often is, is a good thing. Yeah. 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 I'd, I'd love to talk a little bit more about your climate activism and sort of like how you got into using your voice as a climber to speak up for the environment. Yeah. I mean, for me, it was like, it almost just like fell in my lap. I wasn't, I didn't grow up. I mean, I grew up, I was a little bit, I grew up in the mountains. My dad was a mountain god. I've like always loved nature, but I wasn't, I didn't feel like I had a part in saving it by any means. Um, but then I, I started getting invited by the Access Fund and the American Alpine Club to do these lobbying events in DC. And um, I think that's probably what sparked it for me. Like, I didn't like the events per se, but I learned, like, I don't like wearing a suit. So, like, the conversations are always kind of awkward. Um, but I did get this better grasp of how the system works like how the cake is made Mm -hmm. and what really affects the planet and how policy is so important so there's a combination of understanding that and then having a family and that extending my view of like this this time on earth that I'm responsible for isn't just the time that I'm going to experience on earth it's the time that my kids are going to experience on earth I started thinking about it in terms of like kind of the future of humanity just instead of just like my own little bubble of what I would see right. and um and then you, you know that spurred me to start reading books and getting educated and I think once you're educated it's just like you feel like you got to do something why do you think climbers make good climate activists I mean, I think climbers are really good storytellers, like whether they like it or not, like storytelling is a huge part of the climbing culture. And we have dramatic stories to tell a lot of the time and everybody likes to hear stories. So the fact that we, that we have these good stories just makes our voices better heard Mm -hmm. and also makes us better at telling those stories. So um, yeah, it's really mostly about storytelling and, and then having this very intimate relationship with nature. Like climbers specifically tend to fall in love with certain climbing areas and go back year after year after year after year. So I've been going to Yosemite since I was three years old, basically every year to the same places. Like, you know, we climb on the same little chunks of rock. And so, you know, if a tree dies, I notice it. And if a whole forest dies, of course I notice it. And so we really have um I think we yeah we see the change Mm -hmm. in a way that that a lot of other people don't yeah you brought up such a good point about the storytelling aspect of lobbying and it's such a powerful way to connect with people and to influence change what other advice do you have for folks who want to get involved as activists but maybe don't know where to start I mean, I, I'm into the into the Action Works platform a lot. I think um, 
getting involved in your local nonprofits is great for helping, you know, your local environmental nonprofits is great for helping that nonprofit. But the real value is that it puts you in a community that's accessible to you local, mm -hmm. right? Of, of people that love to figure out ways to help the earth. And so when you're in that community, it becomes part of your daily conversation and it becomes on the top of your mind every day. So um, yeah, I think that's the portal really surround yourself with people that care and that will, you know, spread exponentially. Yeah. That is such a powerful way to connect with local nonprofits and to start learning more about all the different ways of being an activist. So what are some of your activism plans going forward with this election year coming up and everything else going on? Yeah. Well, uh, one of the things of, for people that are watching this, the Action Words plat platform is just, um, you know, it's on Patagonia's website. You can just, that's where you go to it. You find it, just type in Action Works and it'll bring you there. Um, okay. So, so activism going forward. So generally the month of October is like the Super Bowl of climbing, right? Like this is when I just like push everything aside and I go climbing and that's all I do. Mm -hmm. um, especially with kids. I was like, I need to hold that time more holy. Um, but this year, because the election, the general election is obviously so incredibly important. I was like, I'm even going to sacrifice that this year because October is kind of the key month um, in my mind. So starting in September, depending, I'm not sure what form it's going to take with the, you know, quarantine life but mm -hmm. I'm going to dedicate my time fully to events, either in person or online to try and influence the election. Um, yeah. All the, all the, the, the fact that the um, current administration is taking advantage <laughs> of the current situation and, and rolling back so many environmental policies is like totally freaking me out. And so that fuels the fire even more. So, yeah. Well, yeah, can we post it on, Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, for me, like moving forward right now, it's like all about elections. Well, keep us posted and keep me posted about how I can support some of that work because it's crucial with the election year that we really mobilize people to become climate voters. And so, yeah, I'd love to support what you're doing and brainstorm too, if there's any ways we could work together. Yeah. Likewise. I feel like you have the capacity to get so much work done more than most people I know. And so I feel like you have your hands in so many things. So likewise, I feel like I can learn a lot from you. Um, yeah. And we can all work together. I, um, so when we, when we testified together at the Senate hearing in September of 2019, I was wondering, do you ever get scared or nervous before public speaking or to speak up about some of the other, in some of the other ways, like on Instagram, like, does it make you nervous at all? Or are you pretty chill about it now uh i mean i think my I, I mean the senate hearing was something very new for me so i got a little bit nervous i got pretty nervous at that one i guess <laughs> yeah me too. um but i've had a i've had a handful of like really high pressure public appearances that have just upped my my bar for tolerance of that kind of thing like naturally i'm not a public speaker at all it's yeah. something i never aspired to do but i've just ended up having the opportunity to do it quite a bit. And it's just kind of progressively made me less and less nervous about it over time. Um, still, sometimes I blow it though. Like I feel like, you know, 10% of the time I show up to some event and it just like feels weird and the audience isn't reacting properly or whatever. And it kind of freaks me out. Um, social media is, is a different thing. I don't, you know, I've, I've, I'm so used to they're being, you know, I think if you're a public figure and you're doing social media stuff, you realize that a certain percentage of the vocal minority are going to seem, are going to attack you, you know? And mm -hmm. so a lot of people, when they first experience that, it makes them not want to even expose themselves anymore. Um, I'm just used to it at this point. I'm like, whatever, it's fine. In some ways, I kind of welcome it. You know, every once in a while, I get some tidbits of knowledge from somebody who sees the world so much different from me. It makes me understand the other side of the arguments. Um, and if people are attacking me, I'm like, that's actually totally fine. Hmm. So I don't get too nervous about it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, where, where, are you, where, are you, where are you with that kind of stuff these days? 
I mean, I feel like it's easier in a lot of ways to like do, I practiced a lot for public speaking over the last year. And so I feel like that part gets easier. I still get nervous for sure, especially like in the Senate, like in front of 10 senators or whatever, that was like a different kind of environment. But I do get scared on social media sometimes just because like sometimes the intensity of like the hatred or the harassment can be, it's just hard for me to deal with sometimes, even though like I know it's, it's going to happen. It's still like mentally, I feel like I kind of have to prepare myself for some of the backlash that's coming. Yeah. Yeah. It kind of freaks me out. Like it's keeping you from speaking out, which is great. What's that? It doesn't seem like it's keeping you from speaking out. I try not to let it. Maybe you have so much in there that it is. I don't know. (laughs) I know. Like there's a lot of things I feel like I'm still working to like really be able to write what I really want to write. Like sometimes I feel like I tone it back a little bit and I'm trying to work on like really not doing that. Like I don't want to dilute my message so that it's easier for people to hear. Like I need to be, I don't know, just to say what I really want to say, but that's really hard to do sometimes. Cause I'm like, I'm going to make a lot of people really angry. Yeah. So like, I, I think that sometimes I have to, like certain things that go through my mind would just be counted if I talked about them publicly. Wait, what did you so say? You cut out generally, a if bit. I have some uh, certain things that go through my mind that I want to speak about, would just be counterproductive. Like at right. some point, you yeah. want to you want to you want to have a product you want to have productive conversations. So if I'm talking about something that I'm doubting, I have like my own little group of um advisors mostly my wife becca she's she's got a very very good head on her shoulders that i vet it with Mm -hmm. um i feel like that's a good way like just get just get a double check from your friends i think that really helps yeah my mom is sometimes that double check for me so i'm really grateful for her when she will like read over a caption before i like press go um but yeah you do a really good job on your social media writing about activism and I really admire like that you're willing to yeah you do a nice job like with your voice too and like the editing process we were just describing (laughs) yeah Yeah. um how does your training for climbing help you prepare for activism uh I don't know I mean there's a certain amount of discipline that you have to learn to become an athlete of any sort and I suppose you can apply that that's the more training side but i think the thing that probably helps me the most is the risk management stuff Mm. like you as an as an athlete who does potentially risky things you're you're used to kind of hanging your neck out there relatively often and i think in activism it feels that way especially in our current political climate um and you have to you I, i think the idea of like finding like this focal point, like this goal that you want, that you think is the right direction and driving towards that, Mm -hmm. that can be applied to being an athlete and it can really be applied towards activism as well. And sometimes those goals are so big and lofty and, um, you know, seem unattainable. Um, But being an athlete teaches you that that happens and then sometimes they come true. So you can, it, it builds belief in activism as well. How do you stay motivated for your activism and for climate? Um, I think I try and pace it properly. Like I need to, uh, like for climbing, I just like kind of the more, the better for me, you know, I wish I could do it, uh, you know, more than I do, Mm -hmm. um, for activism, I, you know, it's not something that brings energy to my life, I would say, but I know it's the right thing to do. Mm So I try and pace it out and I try and pick the things that I can focus enough energy into that I feel like are high value. Mm -hmm. Like people who follow my activism stuff, there's not, there's not tons of it out there actually. It's like, I'm not blasting out things every day. Um, But the things that I do focus on are a little bit more vetted and um, important. And so that means I'm not spending all day, every day obsessing about it. Yeah. Cause it's easy to get kind of burnt out on that. Yeah. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta mix it in the joy. You know, you gotta have a lot of joy in your life, and that's actually another reason why I think a- athletes make good activists because 
there's a lot of joy, you know, we, we're like happy people. We're out there with these amazing chemicals flowing through our bodies. And so when we show up in DC specifically and we sit in an office with the Senator or something, we, we just like, we have this vibe that's so much different than people that are in the policy all day long, every day. And we can talk about these fun stories and um, yeah, that's good. Why should other athletes not be afraid to be politically active? I mean, I think the, <laughs> the less you afraid you can be, the more, the more time you're going to put into it. And, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, there, there's no reason. I don't, I don't even know how to answer that question really. Um, like if you're, if you're, um, I don't, I just don't, it's just, I, I've always tried to not be ruled by fear. Yeah. You know, socially, environmentally, you know, physically, like, you know, you need to do the things that you know, you're, that aren't going to kill, you know, you need to make sure that you're not going to like burn, burn too, crash and burn too hard. But as long as you're not at that point, you should just go, go all in as much as you can. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's like, really annoying to me when people are like, just stick to skiing, keep the politics out of it. Because all of these things that we do, like there were so many people who worked really hard to be able to like protect the land that we ski on today and to create like the experiences that we have now. And so I kind of feel like it's our duty to make sure that we're continuing that, you know? Yeah. Like Yeah. For a long, for a long time, I thought that our, that our spaces that we play on in North America, at least, were a privilege. Like this was our right to have these places. And now I understand more that that's just a matter of laws. You know, like people made these rules and they've served us very well. But it's really our responsibility to keep that going. Um, you know, I think that's one thing you gain when you travel. Like I've tried to do a few climbing trips to China, and China is, you know, it was pretty closed down to climbing for a long time. It's starting to open up because they're understanding the economic benefits of it, but. Um, the fact that we go to these amazing places with all this incredible climbing and I would just be, I'd see it and I'd be drooling. I'm like, oh my God, this is so good. And they're just like, nope, you're not allowed to climb there. You know, we don't really allow that here. Um, made me really value what we have, um, here in yeah. the States. Yeah. Yeah. That's um, cool. A lot of what was that last part? Or in a lot of the other places that we play like Argentina or the Himalayas, you know, there's a lot of places where you where you're allowed to do it, but there's also places that you aren't and it can, and it can change just based on policy. Mm -hmm. Have you made any like failures with your activism? Uh, failures with my activism. Hmm. It's a good question. Or like mistakes that you've made that you've learned from. Well, I mean, weirdly, one of the things that got me involved with my work with the access fund in the first place was a mistake that I made. Mm -hmm. um, when I was 16 years old, I found this really good sport climbing area in, in uh, Western Colorado, mm -hmm. on the Western Slope of Colorado. And, um, and I started going up there and bolting these sport routes. Um, I knew it was on national forest land, but the hillside to get to the climbing area was super loose and um and and we're eroding it by hiking up there all the time and we're like wow well, we need a trail of sorts to get up so we brought like a like a shovel and a pick and a handsaw up there and we built a trail to the mm -hmm. crag and while we were building this trail like a forest service ranger kind of like saw what we were doing and i got busted essentially got all of my all of my climbing gear confiscated and um and so I was 16 years old and I'm like, oh, I'm in trouble from the forest service, from a ranger. I don't really know what to do. So I called the access fund and they, you know, they kind of like sorted it out a little bit for, for me. And I felt indebted to them for a while. So I started donating to the access fund right off the bat. And then a few years later, I, I became a board member of the access fund. And yeah, I guess it all started from, I guess, a mistake that I made. I wasn't, you know, I just wasn't thinking enough about uh, anything but my own selfish want to develop the sport climbing area. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great story because I feel like as the narrative around like mistakes and failure in our society is like, 
you, it, I don't know, it seems really sometimes hard to talk about that stuff. So I appreciate you sharing that story. And those mistakes often lead to some of our like greatest accomplishments or some great parts of our lives. And it seems like you were able to really turn the lemons into lemonade there. Yeah. And I would say there's other activism type events where I haven't put in the, like the prep work. I think I regret that. Like if I have a, if I have a, a chance to make a difference through speaking or writing, but I just don't put in the prep work to do a good job, I'm, I inevitably regret that. Like I, it feels like a missed opportunity and I'm sure that's happened on a handful of occasions for me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it takes a lot of time though. Sometimes it's like hard to really put in those hours. I feel like, like I got asked again in February to go testify to the house natural resources committee. And I feel like it probably took me like 30 to 40 hours of prep work to like write this paper and prepare my speech. And it was really hard to sacrifice. It was such a good February for powder skiing. And there were so many days that I had to like not go skiing. It was, it was really tough. Like it can be hard to, to take that time sometimes. So I think just showing up too is also really important, even if you can't be like a hundred percent prepared. Yeah. And, and I think when you show up in the first place, you don't really need to be that prepared, but as you learn the scene and you get better at talking about it, then you kind of get put into these positions where you are um, in charge. And then that's when you really got to put in the research and yeah. the prep work figure out who like co-sponsored the bill. So you don't ask them to support it. <laughs> I've done that before in DC. Right, yeah. 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 Right. Well, cool. Well, there's a lot of great tidbits there. I wanted to kind of end, I ask like the same kind of questions to everybody at the end, these rapid fire questions. So if it's cool, I'm going to jump into that. So what's your cool. favorite TV show right now? Do you watch TV? Oh man. I very watch very, very little TV. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> my wife gets into these shows on occasion. So I end up just like popping in for like five minutes here and there. I don't even know. I I don't watch enough TV. Okay. Favorite (laughs) book of the moment. Um, so I, I've been, I've been working my way through, there's a couple books that I've been working my way through, but one of them is a crack hour, put it this, put John crack hour, put out this compilation of like, um, you know, old stories that were published in magazines. Uh Um, the name of it's called, but I've been into that one, but also, um, the Yvonne's new book um it's called oh I should have come prepared for this uh was again the prep work what is that what is that new book that Yvonne put out that's also a compilation of all of his kind of like untold stories it kind of it rehashes a bunch of the important stuff but it's called um I'm trying to find out um yeah. lessons from the edge of business and sport is that it yeah, but that's the subtitle, isn't it? Isn't there some? A, it's called Some Stories. Some Stories. Yeah, that's what some it's called. Stories. Some yeah. Stories. Yeah. Yeah. That's the one. That one's really good. Cool. Um, and then actually, I got one sitting here right here next to me. <laughs> stories behind the image. Corey Red. Oh. This is a good one. I, I guess that's where my life is. I've, I've got so many things I'm working on that I, I can only digest books that have a lot of short stories. <laughs> so I'm into the short story books right now. Nice. Okay. Favorite color uh green green favorite food uh burritos i would maybe expand that into just the mexican genre these days Mm -hmm. are you a morning person or a night owl i'm it seems like i am naturally a morning person but um but my wife is really a night owl so i i actually am both these days i wake up early i do my thing in the morning i take a nap around 3 p.m every day <laughs> nice and then i stay up late so i'm forcing myself to be both what's one piece of advice you'd give to your younger self uh oh, let's see one piece of advice i'd give to my younger self um be less selfish. I think I was really selfish when I was young. So try and think outside of yourself. I probably still am, but I'm trying to be less. (laughs) Where can people follow you and support your work? Uh, I mean, my main platform these days is that I'd like to speak out on is just Instagram because it's easy. Mm -hmm. So um, that's probably going to be 
the basis. And actually I have a whole basically memo written right now of my plan moving forward of how to be a little more intentional with my activism and storytelling. And it's the, the portal is always going to be Instagram. I'm going to inform everybody about what I've got going through my head or the live events I'm doing, especially during the rest of our quarantine time, I'm going to really try and do something a week, like a post a week uh -huh. that points people to something else, or sometime it might just be that. Cool. So, awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Anything else you want us to leave with today? Mm, no, I don't think so. That was great. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for spending this time with me. I really appreciate it. It was great to catch up and I'm wishing all the best to you and your family right now. And hopefully we can collaborate on some events going forward for the election. Awesome. Thanks, Caroline. Cool. Good to talk Thanks to you. A ton. Have a great day. Bye. Bye.